Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of A Game for All the Family by Sophie Hanna. So what I know about Sophie Hanna, she was chosen by the Agatha Christie estate to write the new Hercule Poirot books. Um, that's pretty much all I knew going in. I've read a couple of those and really enjoyed them, so I wanted to give some of her like original stuff a chance. Won a job lot on eBay, and this is the first one that I picked up. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say this is going to be more of a vlog style review, um, where I just update you as I go, because at the moment I'm literally on page 20, so 5% of the way in. So uh, yeah, let's get started with the blurb. Dane reads... After escaping London and a career that nearly destroyed her, Justine plans to spend her days doing as little as possible in her beautiful home in Devon. But soon after the move, her daughter Ellen starts to withdraw when her new best friend, George, is unfairly expelled from school. Justine begs the head teacher to reconsider, only to be told that nobody's been expelled. There is, and was, no George. Then the anonymous calls start, a stranger making threats that suggest she and Justine share a traumatic past and a guilty secret, yet Justine doesn't recognise her voice. When the caller starts to talk about three graves, too big and one small to fit a child, Justine fears for her family's safety. If the police can't help, she'll have to eliminate the danger herself. But first she must work out who she's supposed to be. So I relate to this about her husband, because I'm the, of the same ilk as him. I don't like being in silence. And it says, uh, It would never occur to Alex to turn off the music in order to speak. For him, silence is there to be packed as full as possible, like an empty bag. The something that he does, has for as long as I've known him, is singing opera. He travels all over the world, is away for one week in every three on average, and loves every second of his home is where the premiere is existence. Which is lucky. If I didn't know he was idyllically happy with his hectic spotlit life, I might not be able to enjoy my nothing to the full. I might feel guilty. We get this bit as well, because one of the characters is writing a story. Um, it's actually kind of unbelievable because she's a young girl and obviously Sophie Hannah's an accomplished writer. Um, but we get some interesting bits of dialogue which kind of reflect on the art of storytelling. It also reminded me a little bit of uh, Misery by Stephen King, except in that I didn't much like reading the story, whereas in this, um, the story, as opposed to being like a historical kind of romance sort of thing, is a, um, a crime story, like a whodunit. But anyway, she says, um, I read it four times. I thought all the stuff about her killing him was, too, was protesting too much and that no, mother, that would be a cheat. It's in the third person. That would be an unreliable narrator. It would be me, the author, lying. You can't do that. Well, people do it all the time, but I, I mean, I find it, personally, it's quite an annoying trope, so she's kind of right as well. Oh, and also she, the kid goes, all Mr. Goodrick said was don't use the word said. He wants us to use more interesting speech words. That's why everyone in my story exclaims and yelps, in case you didn't notice. All right, and then the main character, we get this, um, which is relatable as a coffee drinker. Swallowing a yawn, I head downstairs, thinking about hot water with a slice of lemon and a spoonful of honey in it. My new morning drink now that I have given up coffee, the favoured fuel of those with too much to do. And what to put in Ellen's packed lunch. This will be the biggest decision I'll make today, tuna mayonnaise or roast chicken and pesto. Once that's sorted, I'll have the whole day free to do what I want, and as luck would have it, I don't want to do anything. The best thing is that whatever choice I make about the sandwich, it won't matter. Ellen won't notice the difference, she eats everything. My decision will affect nothing, which makes me wonder if it counts as a decision at all. Probably not. I find this idea profoundly calming. And another little bit, bit, bit relatable here. She goes, uh, I don't mind being far away from other people. I love it. In fact, people are overrated. And the kid doesn't want to go to school. She says, I don't believe creative work should be interrupted for the sake of an oppressive work regime that it takes. I have to do this kind of work at this time in this place. I mean, you're not gonna get on well in the office world, love. So we get this great idea. I wanna use this myself. So it says, too many people stick around and try to improve things, which often means slogging your guts out to compensate for the deficiencies of others. Personally, I'm a fan of the discard. Leave it, move on. Or as Ben Lorenzo so memorably said the last time I spoke to him, chuck it in the fuck it bucket. So as part of this story that the kid's writing, we have a chapter called Pas Devant Les Enfants, which means not in front of the children. And we get this, which I totally agree with this observation. Ellen, talk me through the chronology of all this, says Alex. Within seconds of arriving home, he was asking why I hadn't sorted out a clear timeline for the George Dombavan business. The word made me shudder. It's only ever used by busy people who need to be efficient. And in the story, there are some workmen, um, and it says, um, they hated the noise, they missed their best friends from school, and they were distracted from their studies by the sweaty bottoms of the workmen, who didn't seem to know how to make their trousers go up as far as their waists. 
Lisette and Alessand didn't understand this at all. Surely someone who can cover a sash window with an elaborate metal structure should not find it too hard to conceal the whole of his bum crap. I apologise for the vulgarity, but it is necessary for what I'm about to tell you. Within days of the coaches from Nottingham arriving, Lisette and Alessandro Ingray had given the workmen a collective nickname, the Bum Crackers. And in the story, the Ingrays get a new music teacher and it says, um, David Butcher, the Ingray girl's new music teacher, introduced himself to Lisette, Alessandro and Perrine with the help of a Hungarian folk song. My name is Mr Butcher, he said, and so that you never forget it, here's a song called The Handsome Butcher. And that just makes me think of, if you watch Cyanide and Happiness, they have a little mini-series called Harry the Handsome Butcher. And as part of this story we get, it might strike you as odd that Sorel, the lazy parent who always preferred to do as little as possible, took the lead here. The sorry truth is that whatever one's natural inclination and personality type, when it comes to an abysmally unpleasant chore, it is the woman and not the man who ends up taking care of it in 99% of cases. And they hatch this plan, This the child has killed uh, the music teacher, and they plan to stab the body to provide evidence so that the police will arrest this kid. But then they say, oh yeah, we're just going to leave him overnight so that we'll call the police tomorrow. And it's like, the police wouldn't know that the body had been lying there for 24 hours before they showed up. The autopsy would pick that up. So we get a moment where the mother hires a private detective and she gives them an email address and suggests he hacks it. But if you know anything about computers, you know it's not that easy. <laughs> oh yeah, and then they go outside. Um, they're woken by the sound of the dog and they go outside and a large grave has been dug in the garden, which is delightful. And a great line from Ellen, the daughter, she says, no school is normal. Any building with more than five people in it is gonna contain weirdness. People just are weird. And Ellen also has this uh, where she goes, that's what real life is like. Often there's no resolution. And that reminds me of the song, Love Like the Movies by the Avid Brothers, which is where it goes, um, well, it's all about, so you wanna be in love like the movies, but the movies are not, but in the movies, they're not in love at all. Um, and then it goes, um, and in the ending, there's no resolution. Real life is more than just two hours long. Oh, and George adds, adds a bit to his story where he describes what somebody's saying is sounding like Eminem's rap in My Name Is. But it's mentioned earlier on that George is like very sheltered and his parents won't let him listen to anything that isn't classical music. So how, how does he know about Eminem? Oh, and she says here in the acknowledgements as well, Speedwell House is loosely based on Greenway, Agatha Christie's holiday home in Devon. So that's quite cool. And she acknowledges Agatha Christie for inspiring her since the age of 12. But yeah, A Game for All the Family by Sophie Hannah. I mean, it is kind of a generic thriller in many ways, but it's a good example of the generic thriller. It definitely kept me guessing until the end. I didn't know what was going to kind of happen from page to page. Um, and overall, it was just it was just pretty good at what it was. It was it was a four out of five, and it was probably a weak four out of five, but I would still recommend it. Um, and I'm now keen to read more Sophie Hannah, which is good because I have three more of her books on my pile. So there we have it, that's what I made of a game for all the family by Sophie Hannah. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye